Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of the, those of you that are in the audience. It's my pleasure to be moderating this fireside chat with all of you and with the very famous Dr. James Mon. Um, for those of you that don't know Dr. J uh, Dr. James Mwangi, uh, I don't know who doesn't know about Dr. James Mwangi, but he is the Group Managing Director and CEO of Equity Group Holdings. He's the Executive Chairman of the Equity Group Foundation. He is one of Africa's most renowned thought leaders, a disruptive entrepreneur and philanthropist. And as a champion of social economic transformation, James believes that individuals and societies have the potential to solve their socioeconomic challenges if they are given opportunity and access to resources. Um, the, I have a whole huge bio of Dr. Mwangi, but I feel that he's kind of famous. And one of the reasons that I said yes to being moderator of this session was the opportunity to have a chat with Dr. Mwangi, who's quite famous in the digital finance space. I've been working in digital finance for more than a decade now. I've been working on building inclusive digital economies in Africa, Asia, and the Pacific. And, G and Dr. Mwangi and Equity Bank are synonymous with innovation, are synonymous with the ability for a bank to leverage its um, its institutional qualities while still being agile, which not every bank uh, is able to do, not many banks are able to do in, uh, in, in pretty much the world. Um, so um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Nandini Harihadeshwara. I'm a senior advisor to the Inclusive Digital Economies Division of the UN Capital Development Fund and also uh, our lead gender focal point. I'm based in Bangalore, India, and it's my pleasure to be here today with all of you. Um, so today we're, we're here to talk about the pandemic, and I have been listening in on the sessions before us, and um, there have been a lot of really interesting discussions on solutions that have come forward from uh, each of the panelists, uh, many banks on these panels, Dr. Mangi, um, that have been talking about solutions they've been bringing forward with and for their customers. Um, but what I wanted to hear from you was some of the unique things that Equity Bank has done in the face of the pandemic. I understand that you're a little bit of a historian, and you actually first studied pandemics, and that led you to actually talking to your customers about not what they need today, not what they need for the next three months or six months, well, what do they need in the next three years? So I wanted to hear from you, what was your unique take on this and how have you, um, what, what actions have you taken as Equity Bank to um, act on the pandemic? I thank you very much, Nadine, for having me. And we could uh, focus on uh, uh, the issue of uh, uh, health was uh, a humanitarian challenge. We felt that um, at least uh, lives and life, but the mechanism of dealing with the pandemic were the most challenging because uh, they caused dis disruptions uh, in, the, uh, in value chains. Uh, they caused uh, disruptions in um, uh, the economic uh, environment and businesses that uh, were doing well before. Most of them ended up uh, shutting down. When we analyzed uh, equity customers, we expected 45% of all our customers would have challenges because uh, of uh, coping uh, or government um, uh, policies of managing COVID, like shutdown of some sectors, shutdown of airspace, shutdown of some cities, uh, essentially meant that uh, businesses had to be closed. And essentially, that's where we asked ourselves, uh, banking is no longer uh, the banking we knew. The customer's cash flow has been disrupted. They have drained out. And those were the 
such as like Brad maintains the body of enterprises. We also recognize that those who had borrowed will no longer be able to maintain uh, their uh, the payment uh, track record because they had no cash flows. And essentially, we felt the best we could do uh, was to accommodate them for the period that we expected that they would be affected. And when we categorized the sectors, the aviation sector, the hotel and tourism industry, we felt that those would be affected for up to four years. Between three and four years, that's when they would be able to recover their cash flows. They would be the raggers uh, in terms of uh, recovery. We also felt that the private education, the schools would take a year, and truly the schools were closed for nine months. And when schools were closed for nine months, then there are no students in school, there is no cash flow. And essentially, we accommodated the schools for one year uh, to ensure we can only demand from them repayments uh, when they open uh, schools and start ca uh, getting school fees. Uh, and that went on with the restaurant, went up uh, with the real estate, those who were in construction, uh, that accommodation. The objective of that was principally uh, to support drives and livelihoods. We knew families, employees depended on performance of businesses. And essentially, we felt that uh, we had a moral obligation uh, to play our role, ensuring we don't disrupt the social order and the economic order of households. At the same time, we also felt that um, it was essential that we don't cause a systemic risk to an economy. We control 68% uh, of all our borrowers are enterprises. And we felt that we needed to keep the rights of the economy on uh, because it's the economy that provides opportunities. At the same time, we felt we needed to uh, help businesses that we uh, wanted uh, to repurpose their enterprises, their businesses to new opportunities uh, because the economy was reallocating resources like uh, in the manufacture of PPEs, uh, food and uh, uh, vegetables. We felt those were new uh, offshoots in the economy and we needed to uh, support them with the credit. So that is how we dealt uh, with both um, an aggression approach of supporting those who were to keep the economic opportunities alive and a defensive one of saving businesses, lives and livelihoods. But at the same time, we felt we could act as a catalyst uh, to ensure community and our customers generally adopted the uh, health protocols of coping with uh, uh, COVID. And essentially, we felt that uh, to get customers to work from home, we needed to accelerate uh, our digital platform. And I'm glad, uh, looking back, uh, we now have 98% of our transactions happening online. Uh, and essentially, to, have to do that, we had to give incentives. And we agreed with the Central Bank of Kenya's proposal that we waive all mobile charges so that it becomes free. And uh, our, 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 on a monthly basis, uh, we are waiving $1.5 million in terms of fees that we are foregoing. And this has really incentivized uh, people. But it also meant uh, increasing disposable income to the, to the households and families by saving them $1.5 million. But we felt that was not enough. We needed to start with the community. And we joined the government effort uh, uh, of uh, uh, COVID uh, management. And we pledged $1.1 million to Kenya, $1 billion to DRC, $1 million to uh, Rwanda, and half a million dollars to Uganda, just so, so that uh, the gov we could complement the efforts of those governments uh, in protecting doctors. Uh, so that uh, there could be a second line of defense for the entire community. And I'm glad that uh, that commitment, uh, together with the COVID VAT that added um, uh, $3 million to the $11 million, gave us a kit of um, $1.4 million that has helped us uh, to maintain the 68 hospitals to date, and we have managed to support them for another 18 months. Uh, with the PPEs. But the uh, magic of it was ensuring we used that FAD uh, to train local manufacturers to uh, repurpose their factories and produce PPEs. All the PPEs we are distributing are now manufactured in Kenya. And Kenya has become a hub for PPE manufacturing, creating enormous jobs 
uh, in the factories and supporting the families that own those factories and cities. Uh, mm -hmm. So that is what we have so, done. So, so I want to. I, I mean, you you kind of you already answering one of my questions. So I'll I'll, I'll pose the question here. So you know, you were asked by the president by by the country to not only join the national task force on COVID nineteen response, but also actually to chair the health committee, in which you have. As, as, as far as I know, no background in health, uh, other than you know going to the doctor and all of those things. And so, ultimately, you were able to sort of work with your team, work with obviously your colleagues with an equity bank, but also whoever was on the committee, bringing people together to, as I understand it, first examine where can we get PPP, PPE anywhere, and then sort of coming down to a process where Maybe it just makes sense for us to make it here, um, and then sort of helping to actually jumpstart uh, PPE industry within Kenya. I mean, that's really the story that you've just told, and I wanted to make sure the audience understands that because it's kind of tremendous, and it goes to one of the points that you wanted to, to make when we were kind of having our pre-discussion on this fireside chat about the role of the financial services industry around the world in building back better um, and what their role is maybe beyond just financial services uh, obviously within financial services but also beyond financial services do you want to speak a little bit to that and i'd love to just hear your your journey because i mean becoming chair of the health committee when you don't have a health background and then Coming to this, that's a big journey, maybe for you too. I think it's certainly a very big step, uh, and uh, it has demonstrated to me the power of interdependence. I was not a medical doctor, but uh, I knew that uh, the chairman of uh, the group, Professor Masharia, uh, is uh, a professor in medicine, ENT. I knew uh, my colleague, uh, John Khalil, who heads Equity Afia. Uh, and supervises quality of delivery is a medical doctor. And I called on them and said, here is a challenge I've been given. How do I go around it? And the advice was, uh, why don't we constitute an advisory committee? And quickly, they picked up the chair of the Nurses Association, uh, the Clinical Officers Association, the Practicing Medical Association, and they picked also a director from the Ministry of Health. And I went back to the, with the names to the board and said, you have given me the mandate of uh, chairing the health committee. Allow me uh, to nominate this uh, team uh, as our advisors. And that is how eventually. So essentially, what did we bring? Uh, I, I was with my colleagues, uh, the bankers, what we call it the team of rivals. Uh, Equity Bank, ACB, Safaricom, uh, Absa Bank, those are really, we compete. And essentially, uh, then we said we are entrepreneurs, uh, we are good managers. If we get the doctors to bring their knowledge, uh, we'll have an intersection between capital, we, call, we have $1.4 billion, we have entrepreneurship skills, uh, we have a member of the board who is the uh, Chief Executive of Kenya Association of Manufacturers who mobilize the manf uh, manufacturers for us, but the doctors who do the specification and supervision, and it's for them as the users who tick uh, when the quality is. So it brought out the issue of collaboration, but more importantly about partnership between the private sector and the government. And uh, as you can see, we have taken the responsibility of supplying PPEs uh, from the government to public hospitals for a period of at least uh, uh, two years. So uh, that partnership and collaboration has allowed the best knowledge and capability, oversight, uh, to work together. And it has taught me a lot of lessons about collaborations and partnerships. And particularly what you said, uh, uh, the disruption of international uh, value chains or global value chains taught us also a lesson about the resilience of economies, uh, the uh, resilience of economies to support lives and livelihoods. And I hope, Ufre, the fact that Kenya has now become a major exporter of PPEs to Europe and America and across the region tells us how maybe 
we could develop uh, economies out of necessity, identifying and converting one sector at a time. Yeah, I mean, that's an amazing sort of uh, sh uh, a success story and sort of um, like light at the end of the tunnel kind of story, right? In, in, in a year that's been a very difficult year for so many people, uh, especially those that are sort of the poorest of the poor. And so you were talking a lot about community. This is something that's close to your heart. You, you've been taught you, one of the mm, advocacy points you've been having and want to make is the advocacy point to your fellow bankers, to your fellow uh, individuals in the financial services industry, that it's more than just profits and it's more than just extending um, terms and loans and, and, and other kinds of financial services, but it's also about giving back to the community and dividends to the community. And so the other point that you've made that's, that's very important, not just in Kenya, but everywhere, is digital has become prime, right? Given COVID-19, the growth of the importance of digital has been, um, you know, un unimaginable. Um, and so I wonder if you can speak to what's easy and what's hard about that, especially when you're trying to serve the really hard to reach communities, right? The folks at the last mile, the people at the least dense populations that still need uh, financial services, still need them just as much as everybody else. Um, I wonder if you can speak a little bit to that and how equity handled that, solid, that those challenges during this difficult time. Uh, COVID has been exposed, uh, particularly the digital divide and exclusion of majority of the people. As uh, we said uh, lightly, uh, when Equity uh, launched uh, its uh, digital platform, uh, online banking, we realized that those who didn't have smartphones were struggling to download the apps. Uh, right. And it's that we said. I uh, will uh, finance all our customers who don't have smartphones and who would wish to have a smartphone. So enablement of uh, uh, the excluded uh, on a digital inclusion uh, in banking is very, very essential. But what struck us most uh, uh, was the fact that um, out of uh, the 36,000 uh, wings to fly and Elimu scholars that Equity has been supporting, 17,000 of them were in school. But these are, uh, most of them, almost 87% of them are orphans. And when they went uh, home, uh, they had no chance of continuing studying because the family didn't have a phone, didn't have um, uh, maybe electricity connected to, uh, to that, they didn't have a radio. And that exposed us to how much most of the rural communities, as you have said, are excluded from the digital world. And it took us uh, to work with the MasterCard Foundation to provide the 17,000 uh, scholars, each with a small radio so that they could follow classes uh, from Kenya Broadcasting Corporation, each with um, a phone and a charger so that they could digitally connect with uh, their teachers, and each of them with a solar panel and a light so that they could study like all the other kids, uh, my kids and your kids. And so again, you can see that enablement needs to be done. I don't think it's only for students who needs to be given access to digital platforms, but also to the general society. Uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, digital exclusion at the economy level. Uh, we are now talking about online platforms. Most of the businesses have gone online. Payments have gone online. But the tools for enablement, uh, the distribution and the logistics of distributing online commerce uh, goods, which have to go to the last mile, has been wanting. Uh, most of them don't have an address where goods and services can be dropped. So essentially that need uh, to consciously know there is a social investment of infrastructure, the backbone needs to be laid. Hopefully the government can play the, that law. But as you likely said, the private sector needs to have some compassion. Maybe give capitalism a face and a soul and a heart so that it is head, mind, and heart uh, in really bridging that gap. Because the next really uh, creator of disparities and inequality in the world is uh, digital access. 
is uh, those who are excluded essentially will be impoverished. So I think we need to collaborate, and uh, the private sector must really play a role in enabling its customers. If uh, uh, equity enabled just all its customers to be on the platform, and we can do it creatively, then we could really uh, bridge that gap and hopefully uh, stop um, the widening of the gap uh, between those who access digital opportunities and those who miss digital opportunities. Because opportunities is what creates the gap. Wealth is created by those with opportunities. Uh, and wealth uh, uh, lacks to those who have no opportunities. Yeah, and wealth doctor of livelihoods. Really, livelihoods is about uh, disposable income. Yeah, Doctor, I completely agree. And what I think is just really important to highlight is in Kenya, which is sort of the heart of mobile money, heart of digital finance, heart of equity bank, um, you know, heart of all of the innovations that the financial services industry plays there, you are still pointing out something in Kenya that's relevant, and it's really relevant around the world, right? That with digital exclusion, right? And I know that you're part of the UN uh, task force on the digital financing of the SDGs. And, and this, is, this came out very clearly in the report. Digital has a role to play in closing exclusion, but it can also further exclusion. And it's all up to us on how we handle that issue. And so building inclusive digital economies is hard work. And it's still a challenge um, give, even given all of the work that you have done, that the industry has done, that the government has done in Kenya, which is sort of the heart of digital in many people's minds, um, and, and it really reflects a challenge that so many others face. So we're looking, hopefully, post-vaccine world. I'm getting, I'm getting uh, when I read the U.S. papers, when I read the Indian papers, when I read other papers, you know, uh, some of the headlines are around vaccines, right? So we know vaccines are coming. We're hoping in a post-vaccine world, we're really going to be focused on building back better. That's something that you said. So how do we use digital to leapfrog economic development, especially for MSMEs, and then maybe especially for women MSMEs? I know women are uh, part of the heart of the inclusive growth strategy of equity banks. So I wonder if you can speak to that as well. Yes, uh, COVID has exposed uh, uh, all the part of the world that is not working. And that is why we need to not just rebuild the world, but we need to build it better. We need to rethink and say we don't want a world with uh, widespread inequalities. We don't want uh, a world where opportunities are not fairly and even redistributed. There should be fairness and justice. Uh, in distribution of opportunities. We need a world uh, that is more resilient, uh, such that uh, we don't get uh, a complete breakdown uh, because of a medical state, and the world is held as hostage uh, by a pandemic. So essentially, that transformation of building better, I think, need not to be on the legacy rails. Uh, the legacy rails have led us to where we are, we need to leapfrog on new knowledge and new thinking. And the easiest way is not uh, to go back to the legacy systems. We can uh, leverage and leapfrog on uh, fintech capabilities, innovations on the digital space to ensure easy access uh, by all. The good thing with the digital world is that uh, it, it is easily accessible and uh, fairly affordable to all. And uh, I think uh, the fintech capabilities and digital capability, online, uh, virtual uh, world, uh, can help us avoid the massive capital that it it was required uh, in the previous um, order of legacy systems. Um, and essentially, the uh, digital world opens and breaks the barriers and walls. Uh, that uh, keeps on uh, one of physical distance and on geography for that matter, uh, the, uh, the time as a, 
uh, as a divide and as a barrier. All those are eliminated by a digital world. Uh, equal opportunities across the world simultaneously. So leveraging on that, and given that uh, a continent like Africa, with a mean age of 18 years, that population has been born and brought up in a digital era. So embracing and using digital uh, uh, tools uh, will be very easy for them. And they can leapfrog that and build innovations on top of that, uh, use fintech capabilities as, as of old uh, models, and maybe leapfrog in building business models. Uh, business models that are not capital intensive, they are not built on the traditional uh, old models uh, that are very intensive in capital. The, we are talking about going to uh, the fourth industrial revolution that is knowledge-based to a great extent. It's technology-driven. Uh, We're talking of big data. We're talking of um, an artificial intelligence, analytics capability, machine learning. That would then give young people who may not have the massive capital that it was required in the previous old uh, economic and world order, an opportunity uh, to look for. And we've seen that uh, with uh, the big techs. The, all of them were originated and founded by people who were under 30, who didn't need the massive capital. And essentially, the knowledge and the capital will then meet and bring together young people with knowledge and uh, older citizens or senior citizens with, with the capital together and hopefully share the benefits of development across uh, uh, the world based on knowledge and ba uh, based on capital access. Um, thank you for that. And I, I completely agree. I think digital finance, Marianne from Kenya asked a similar question to what I just asked, which is what role would digital financial services play, especially in the recovery of SMEs post COVID as they are the most affected with loss of income and business losses, which I think you've answered sort of, right? The role of, AI, the role of big data, the role of data analytics, right? You being able to use a transaction history in order to determine credit risk, um, being able to issue loans fast, right? And recover from those loans fast, being able to offer different kinds of financial products. Those seem to be all um, in the playbook of not of equity bank and other banks that I've, I've sort, of, sort of seen on the panel discussions today um you know artificial intelligence as well uh you know kind of playing that role in trying to determine risk and trying to really increase the speed with which uh, uh products can be uh deployed and and funds can be deployed to customers as well as um, sort of new products that really can innovate and and help uh, with this recovery. So uh, yeah, I think that's very much in line with what other right. others are seeing as well. Are there is there anything else you would want to add to that, Dr. Uh, Mogi? Yeah, I think uh, through the um, uh, digitization, uh, the fintech capabilities will truly transform banking. Uh, to us, equity is no longer the place you go to. The branch has very little role. It only had those two percent of our customers. Every, uh, Ninety-eight percent of customer transactions are happening on our digital platforms. Banking is what you do on your devices. Payments uh, are now being an apparatus of lifestyle. It's no longer about checks. It's digital payments. Uh, it's online payments. So again, uh, it's pay as you move, consume, pay as you go, and geography and time are no longer relevant. We have been able to compress geography and time such that banking is wherever you are, whatever time uh, you want to consume. And that is the driver of banking. The most important thing is that because we have moved from brick and mortar, we have moved from fixed cost infrastructure to variable cost infrastructure. Uh, and more important with that variable cost infrastructure is for third parties. So essentially, banking is going to now follow a model of uh, shared prosperity. It's the agents who are doing the transactions. It's third party merchants that are completing transactions. It is algorithms and agents uh, and AI capabilities 
of um, innovators that are supporting banks to make the decisions. So essentially, uh, banking has embraced an open system uh, where capabilities are brought in and then banks just organize and create a brand. And essentially, then the cost of banking is reduced substantially uh, from uh, the cost of branches and cash management, CIT, that we all know about it, counting cash, manual jobs in the branches, all that is eliminated. The consequently, the benefits are to the customer. Banking will be completely uh, affordable, but more importantly, conveniently accessible, wherever you are, whatever type. Dr. Mwangi, I'm told by the organizers that we have about one and a half more minutes left. Um, I want to just make one point about what you just said and then ask the last question, if that's okay. Um, the, the one point I wanted to make is not all banks have done what you have done. Um, I think Kenya might be the exception. Um, I, I haven't necessarily seen all of these changes in other countries that I work in, but in Asia, Africa, and the Pacific. Um, I do think that the financial services industry in every country has tried to respond, but their ability to be agile has been different you know, based on a variety of factors. And so I'm so thankful to you for your leadership and your thought leadership to be sharing with the banking industry writ large the kinds of prioritizations you've made and been successful with. Um, so please continue uh, doing that even beyond today. Um, my last question to you is, what has surprised you in 2020? What is something that's really, you didn't expect you, you know, this is something that is your biggest surprise for 2020? I think the biggest surprise is the insights that all of us has really been able to pick. Uh, from the situation. The first one is how COVID uh, almost uh, brought equality on mankind. It disregarded the status, it disregarded the class, it disregarded the race, and uh, almost uh, brought us to the same level of concern only about our health. Uh, it has really exposed maybe um, how much society needs to value uh, uh, social assets. In social assets, I mean something like health. You could see uh, essentially for those who uh, have very low incomes, uh, they have gone through massive devastation. So the investment on uh, social assets, and I mean health and education, should be basic. And maybe the insight is that we need to rethink uh, how we categorize health and education as investment. We've always categorized them as social investment, but I think they may not be a social investment. Their funding pro mechanism may not be right because the suffering of the majority has been exposed. Uh, the I don't think since uh, maybe a hundred years, we haven't seen the suffering of humanity the way we have seen it uh, this way. We talk of uh, nearly uh 200 million people in uh, uh, in africa uh, uh sliding uh, to abject poverty because of a health pandemic and again again uh, the system has not held up we have seen and it's not in kenya it's not in africa every country has been challenged including the superpowers like the us uh, so the issue of uh, uh, social uh, investment i think has been brought to front it has surprised me uh, that we can have all the capital investment we had capitalism would be thriving and it's brought to a halt uh, because it never took care uh, of the larger society's interest uh, and uh, that made to me is the biggest lesson that, uh, even capitalism has its limits uh, and its application Thank you very much, Dr. Mwangi, for this fascinating conversation. I know I learned a lot. I hope everyone in the audience has learned as much as I have or more. Um, we are delighted to give it back to the hosts uh, to continue this conversation as part of the Singapore T FinTech Festival.